Welcome to Minor Details. I'm Nick. And I'm James. And we are two industrial designers in the big city. Sweating the small stuff. And we're back. We haven't hung out in a while, James. It has been a while since we have not had... A guest. A guest. Well, I think the last... We re- we pre-recorded a few guest episodes. Yes. Or just one. So we're excited for that one. And then, uh, well, we had Joey Zeladon, two-parters. Yeah. And uh, yeah, before that was like BYU, and then I was gone. Yeah, I don't know. It's it's been a while. You know, I would uh, I have to touch back on something. You know, uh, we kept we keep calling Joey Joey Zeladon, but I noticed that on the podcast he he pronounced it. Uh, I think it was Zeladon, or like we're pronouncing it as if he's a dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, and, are, I, have we gotten this wrong the whole time? Am I, I gonna have to go back and edit all the times we say Zeladon? To be Zeladon? Zeladon. Zeladon? I, I think that's, I, if, if I remember correctly, uh, and I might be yet again mis- mispronouncing it, uh, but I said, that, I said to Joey, I said, uh, you know, I'm sorry about that. I messaged him and he's like, I don't, I don't think anybody in my family even knows how to pronounce it. But, <laughs> okay, okay. Well, I don't feel as bad then. But, uh, but yeah, so Zeladon. Yeah, if you didn't listen to those two past episodes, they were great two-parter oh um, yeah but yeah i mean what have you been up to james i know you went to arizona i kind of want to hear about that yeah went out to asu arizona state university um you know uh it was great uh they had me out to talk about experimentation and, how hot was it oh it was almost i think it was 100 degrees if not almost and it it was still it was still april it was mid like mid april yeah that's and it's not even summer yeah that's good. yeah that's crazy. But um, shout out to Calvin and Henry, who uh, I think spread the good word, got got me out there. Um, and we know Henry, talented yeah. Mr. Ripley. Henry would Henry told us that he rides his bike in the summertime in Arizona. And I, I don't know what how hot it gets in the summertime. Yeah. I assume it's like 115 well, degrees. But. Yeah, I mean, they have, you know, they have the dry heat thing going uh-huh. on. The dry heat. But, right. but yeah, I, I mean, so... The the talk, you know, I think the talk went well and but the the thing was is that after the talk, and this is my formal apology to the students of ASU, after the talk, I, I don't know what it was. I don't know if it was the nerves that were in preparation for the talk or if it was the heat or the fact that I flew in that morning or maybe the tacos I had for lunch, but I felt like very nauseous oh no afterward and and you know uh me and and about i would say maybe 15 students and uh the head of the program um whose name is escaping me at the moment uh they took me out to a bar and for like drinks and food yeah yeah and and i'm just i'm sitting there doing very deep breathing just trying to collect trying to collect myself you know a lot of students asking me questions and you know i was happy to answer those questions as soon as the food arrived and i took one bite of it i was like oh no i've got to go i have to leave so i mean that's a that's a pretty jam-packed day if you're flying in the same day you're doing the talk yeah and you also eat tacos i mean you know that that stuff's bound to happen yeah it was rough so wait um, you didn't tell me what your talk was about so it was um it was about experimentation okay. in design. And so I guess it was a part of a larger series. And um, so I ended up talking about my my experimentation within my process. You know, a lot of my sketching process is sort of, you know, experimentational. Right. Um, got and, the continuous line sketching. Yeah. You got and, your phone sketching. Yes. And more recently... Um, and I and I talked about this in my presentation. I've been doing sketching in Apple Notes, which is crazy. <laughs> is it? Is You're it a that mad crazy? Man. Uh, you know, I have to I have to give a shout out to Monica. What's her last name? Uh, Monica R something. Rock yeah, Rose? Monica at BYU. We were at the Women in Design talk at BYU, and she was sitting next to me, and she was writing. Um, she was writing in notes and I, did you get the last name? Yeah, Robinson. Okay. Uh, shout out to Monica. Um, 
So she was writing in her notes with her Apple Pencil. Instead of typing. Instead it. of typing. Mm-hmm. And I just, I, I thought it was so interesting. You know, you think uh, you think that the, the next generation, you know, the, the art of handwriting is, is lost and they're not doing it anymore. <laughs> but I was... That sounds like such like a, like a 90s elementary school thing. Of yeah. Like, oh, these kids are learning how to type. They're never going <laughs> to learn cursive anymore. You know? Well, I don't, I don't know if they are teaching cursive anymore. I don't think so. But did anyway... Did you learn cursive? I did learn cursive, I learned cursive but too. I can't... I, I can't. definitely don't remember it at all now. Yeah. My signature is... Well, I'm not going to explain it because then you can just forge it. Yeah. But... Um, but anyway, so I saw Monica writing in her notes app and it got me very curious about the app because I've tried like doing little bits of yeah. sketching with it before, but what ended up happening was on my way back from BYU, I was in the plane and I was, this is kind of an aside, but I was in the middle of a, a professional rugby team. I was like surrounded by a professional rugby team. Luck- so they're big, big guys. Luckily there was nobody in the middle seat. That was also a rugby player. Like so, I had the middle seat free because oh, the guy, thank goodness. Thank the goodness. guy on I thought the, you were in the middle seat. No, was, oh. oh, that oh. would have been. But the yeah, the guy. I was in the window seat. The guy on the aisle seat, his his legs were the size of like a redwood tree trunk. You know, <laughs> um, but uh, I I just I got out my iPad and I just started doodling, and I just kept going. I you know I got out I got out the notes app. And uh, decided not to get my my pen out because I I like the Apple Pencil, but like the constant like charging and and all that kind of gets annoying to me at times. I would love to get the new one because yeah, it's sna- magnetic snaps on. But um, yeah, I just started drawing in it, and and the coolest thing that I found about it, well, one, I like the limited amount of tools because I think that sometimes. You know, between Sketchbook or Procreate, there's just so many options and tools. And and those programs are so much, although I say Sketchbook is like, I prefer it for sort of like iteration if I were going to choose one over the other. Right. But, you know, Procreate is, is very like rendering specific. You know, all these apps, they, ha- they have all the same features. Yeah. They have like slightly different things, but right. all of them have like a bunch of yeah. you know, knickknacks and things that can distract you. But yeah. like you're right, the Notes app has like a pen a- and a marker. Yeah, and pen, a- marker, and pencil. And like five colors. Yeah, five colors. And then like a little like, you know, swatch of colors if right. you want to get fancy. Um, and so I just kept drawing and I was like, this is really kind of addictive. And the other... The part of it that I found really addictive is the endless scroll ability of yes. it. Yes. Well, you've been doing live streams now, yeah. which I believe are there on Sunday. Do you have a set time now? I haven't. I haven't established a set time because okay. I'm I'm wondering if I need, need to do them on Saturday so that if I'm going to do render weekly, I can model it out on Sunday. Oh, that could be. But could be I well not. I don't know if I would live stream that. But but yeah, I mean. Um, so yeah, I've been doing these sort of like weekend live streams, and you know what's nice about doing the endless scroll for the live streams mm-hmm. on the on, you know you you've been doing Instagram Live, you have your iPad set up kind of in portrait mode, yeah, you're sketching with your finger in Notes app, and as you keep coming with concepts, you you know you scroll down, yeah, but it's nice because when I do my live streams. When I want to move on to a new page, I have to start it again, like start fresh. Right. So anyone that joins is like, oh, there's a blank page. I don't want to watch this. And, and goes. <laughs> is that what people write in your comments yeah, section? They like, say what that. is this, Nick? And then they've been leave. on here for a half an hour staring at an empty page. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but no, I think jerks. I think there is something kind of unique about the the vertical scroll on the notes app, the endless scroll. Yeah, it's it's been a lot of fun, and it's I think it's. It's uh, uh, rejuvenated a, a certain spirit I have, like uh, towards sketching. Um, I also will attest you have been using this for professional work as well. I've, yes. I've seen you use it on, <laughs> on, on some of our professional work. Yeah, it's it's fun, man. So I I encourage anybody out there if you haven't tried sketching in Notes, give it a try, and uh, you know uh, if you happen to catch one of my live streams, I'll I'll show you how I do it. Um, but yeah, it's been fun. That's cool, man. So, um, well, we are entering Design Week. We are New York Design Week. It is the eve of New York Design Week. It is. Oh, yeah. So this will be released on Monday. Yeah, which will be kind of the beginning of Design Week, essentially. Yeah. 
Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm super excited. I'm gonna try to go and see all the the fun furniture and all the design. Do you parties. already have all your events lined up? Do I you know? I definitely have some events like logged. But, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I you know I kind of like to wing it. <laughs> I'm a wing. I'm a wing it kind of guy. <laughs> I, can bear, I always tell They're people, like, Nick, there's free drinks over here. That's how I do. That's how I do. <laughs> I always tell people I can barely plan a day ahead. Yeah. So I always know what I'm doing tomorrow, but after that, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I mean, I guess some of the things that I'm excited about, uh, you know, I if you follow me on Instagram, you probably notice I do. I've been releasing my project, The Wait Wait. Oh, yeah. We haven't talked about it too much on the podcast, but you know. I know one of our feedback from our survey we did last year was like, they don't want to hear about what we post on Instagram as oh. much. I think it's okay to talk about it, but... I think you can do a, a deep dive. Yeah. A deeper dive. Oh, you want me to go the other way, deep dive? Yeah. I guess that makes sense, actually. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, I am exhibiting the Wait Wait for the American Design Club Sound and Vision Show. Nice. Which I'm super excited about. It is going to be in Times Square. Times Square? That's right. <laughs> Gosh, darn it. Um, and yeah, I think maybe. Is it going to be in the old Toys R Us? Like, where is it going to be? There's an old Toys R Us in Times I, Square. I think it's. I, is it I, still open? I don't think it's open anymore. But I haven't been, honestly, That's I haven't been to Times Square in years. Yeah. We try to avoid it. Yeah. New Yorkers avoid Times Square. Absolutely. Um, but yes, if you want to go visit it, it's, it'll be open from May 10th to the 22nd, I believe. That's awesome. It's just in the center. You'll be able to find it. It's really easy. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, the wait, wait, if you haven't been keeping up, is this kind of fun idea. And the fun thing about this product was I came up with it during the live stream, during my live streams. That's very cool. So we were sketching on this exhibition, the Sound and Vision Show, where you have to create some sort of sound installation thing or sound product. Um, and yeah, I was sketching up things that were like alarms, started going toward kitchen timers yeah, and then made a concrete kitchen timer. What and am I kind doing of, here? I'm not even bringing it up. Let's see it. And, um, yeah, I was thinking about concrete and I thought that was kind of a good juxtaposition. Like yeah. having a, a very mundane kitchen product, but also... I don't know this this very heavy weighted object. Yeah, and it gives it some dual functionality. You know, you can use it as a paperweight now. Um, I I find that one of the unique uses of it is, and this is inspired by my friend Henry. He's working on a project kind of similar, but it's a, like a task management device. Mm. So it's a timer. So you have this like handle at the top that you can twist. Yeah, and you know you can twist it to sixty minutes and let it kind of tick around. And since it's a weight, you can put it on top of your phone or your laptop to keep you on task, right? Yeah. And it's, you know, it's an, it's a very physical obstruction that is, you know, it will very physically remind you that you should not be checking your phone. Right. Your phone buzzes. You literally have to have some effort to, like, lift the weight off and check your phone. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, you can check it out. It's on my website. It's on the Behance. Give the Behance some love. Give it um, some love, people. I, I need that appreciation. You know, mm. those appreciations are what I what I what I live for. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't. Did we ever talk about my uh, mine and Reed's live stream with MakerBot? I don't think so. You did. Oh, we we uh, we advertised it. Yeah, that was fun as well. That was that was a lot of fun. I have to say, I love the live stream format, and I especially like doing it with somebody else. You know, live streaming is the new design, dude. If you're not live streaming, <laughs> <laughs> you're not designing. If you're not live streaming your entire design career, oh. does anybody even care? Well, there's that story about the guy who live streamed uh, his life 24 seven, mm-hmm. um, and he's found a Twitch. Like oh. the the guy who found it, I believe that's the story. When they found a Twitch, it started off as a 24 seven live stream of just some guy. That's so, wild. Uh, I think. But yeah, Don't the, quote me on that. the good the good people at MakerBot brought us in, and we did uh, well, you know we did a demo of the form families, form families, yeah. um, and we also posted. There, you can go back and watch it too, right? It's on yeah. the YouTube MakerBot YouTube. Yeah. yeah, and and we also just posted the the Behance version of the project, kind oh. of explaining the background. I didn't know. I didn't know you just posted that. I gotta appreciate that. Yeah. Go click that appreciate too. So if you're gonna click my wait wait. Gotta go click James's uh, James's and Reed's uh, 
watering cans too. Yeah. So so we, it's cool because you know this this project is is part part design project, but also part educational. You know, we're trying to we're trying to spread the good word about about the form families and and how we utilize them in our careers and you really, know yeah, who we I, learned it from. I feel like the form families is like a very unique approach to coming up with the forms and I really should take more advantage of it because mm-hmm. it seems very it's like a very process driven and logical way to come up with a, like a lot of ideas and a variety of ideas right. as well. It's just, I mean... Like, if you get stuck, you can easily kind of jump around and be yeah. like, oh, I'm stuck. I'm doing rotoforms. Let me jump to flow forms. Right. It's just, uh, you know, just like your um, your philosophy of familiarism, it's another framework to push a design through to, mm. to try and find sort of new and novel um, forms and and functions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah, big shout out to Joe Ballet and Mitzi Vernon for teaching us the process. Joe Ballet, the founder of the Form Families, but um, but yeah, that was that we, was pretty fun. We can link to that video too if you guys want to watch it. Yeah, that'd be cool. Um, okay, another news. Oh, man. <laughs> Design Week news. We got Hot. we got lots of news and catching yeah. up to do. We haven't this seen each other for like Sunday four weeks. paper. Yeah. Um, yeah. So hold tight. We'll actually get to some meaty stuff eventually. <laughs> <laughs> but I am really excited. Like this one is like. Uh, I'm, I, I'm super excited about this. This is, I'm releasing my bottle opener oh, for Almost Object. Yeah. Uh, you know, Almost Object is my kind of side design brand that I like to play around with interesting and experimental objects. So for the past like four months, I've been designing a bottle opener. Um, actually, if you count like my first bottle opener I designed, I designed one back like two and a half years ago mm. for Almost Object. Right. But it... I realized that it was a failure and I hated the design. So I scrapped it and got rid of it. Um, but I finally picked up the project again. And uh, I was actually, so I'll, I'll tell a little bit about this. Yeah. Uh, you know, the bottle opener itself is a piece of CNC'd aluminum. And it's CNC'd in a similar form to a spinning top. Yeah. And then on the bottom here, it has a cutout where it can come in to the cap of a uh, a bottle and pop it off yeah so it's kind of just a fun almost fidget bottle opener where you can just take it spin it on the table um, yeah and play with it but yeah i'm excited about it i was actually designing bottle openers in vr and you know i was thinking about revolves and just kind of using different tools because there's a limited set of tools in uh, gravity sketch and so, yeah, I was revolving, and I was like, well, what if I did a revolved bottle opener? And then it kind of lent itself to be a top. I mean, it's very, like... Hey, man, that's a form family. A form family. Way of discovering... Uh, Rotoform, right? Yeah. That's really cool. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I mean, I've mean, i been working through manufacturing for the past several months, getting samples. I think I got, like, four samples in before it was just right. Uh, and you got dropped by a factory for this yes. project, right? I, we talked about that. We I did think, talk about this on the podcast where the factory emailed me and was like, uh, "Your your standards are standards are too high. We, <laughs> we cannot work with you anymore." Yeah. So um, you you sent this out to a couple more factories yeah. and found one that could. I got a new factory that like, was happy to work with me. Yeah, they did. They could see and see it the right way. Yeah. And if you want to see and see it, get on that YouTube. Yeah, look yeah. at it. We're I'm, looking at it right now on the YouTube. Um, but also, you know, we'll we'll post pictures, obviously. Yeah. So so I have some things planned. It'll be released for Design Week. Yeah. Um, and you know, you can you you guys can buy one on almostobject.com. So yeah, it's just like it's a product that I've been working on for a long oh, no. time. Oh, James is oh, it's spinning <laughs> it's spinning off the table. Oh. Uh, okay. There we go. Oh, that's a good spin. Um, so it's a project I've been working on, and it's always exciting to kind of have something come to fruition. Yeah, for sure. I'm I'm just hoping that it continues to spin and that everybody realizes that they're dead and in a dream. It's Inception. It is Inception. It kind of it does kind of remind me of the movie. <laughs> um, it does spin for a while. It spins for yeah, a good minute. It's a nice spin. Uh, so yeah, excited about that, and stay tuned for more updates on that. Um, let's see other updates. We got lots of <laughs> updates, guys. I'm sorry. Uh, we got merch now. Merch for the podcast, guys. Uh, we got some pins, little asterisk, the minor details asterisk. Um, 
And yeah, you can pin it on your hat, pin it on your shirt, pin it on your backpack, whatever you want. Pin it on your boyfriend or girlfriend. Not their physical body. Wherever you want. You might be able to know. I don't think we should promote that chance. <laughs> Maybe it could be an earring or something. Oh, it's a large, that would be It's cool. a large earring, though. I would love to see that. <laughs> See somebody rock that as an could, earring. Maybe we could just make minor details earrings. We should do a how do you wear your pin hashtag competition. Okay. I think it's got to be how do, you, how do you wear your minor details pin. Yes. Yes. Hashtag. I don't know. We'll figure it out. <laughs> uh, but we will post a link on our website to this. So check that out. Uh, MinorDetailsPodcast.com. Yeah. Or is it minor de- details po- Yeah, it's yeah. MinorDetailsPodcast.com. <laughs> and there, there will be a link to where you can purchase the pins. But yeah, you know, if you've been listening, if you've been enjoying the episode, we'd love for you to support us this way. So Yeah. And I hope you enjoy these things. Pretty- yeah, and we felt like, you know, we're a couple industrial designers here. We should get, offer you something physical, something metal. Yeah, we'll work up to it. Eventually, we'll have the minor yeah, details. That's a, that's a nice uh, Ooh. top as well. Oh, James is spinning it. Oh, it's a it's actually turning into a bottle opener as we speak. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, and you know, eventually we'll have the minor details, uh, a whole suite of products. You yes. can get your minor details lamp and bed. And <laughs> eventually we'll have the We're... minor details version of the iPhone. It'll be not We just... have other news. We are now com- opening a competing brand to Ikea. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, so lots of stuff to take in there, guys. Check all the, the descriptions for all the links and stuff. Yeah. But we're excited. A lot of a lot of big things happening, and I hope you guys are excited as too. Yeah, for sure. Um, so topic. Oh time. my gosh, guys, guys and gals, let me tell you a little story. Nick gets back from design from from des- Milan, yeah, Design Week, and uh, he gets back to United the United States of America, sits down next to me um, at our place of mutual work, and says, James. I've come up with a great new theory, <laughs> but I don't want to talk about it until we do a podcast. And that was a month ago. That was a month ago. I have literally been <laughs> waiting for a month to hear this theory. Oh, Kept man. in the dark the entire time. If you want anybody to tell your secrets to, Nick P. Baker is your man. I can keep secrets. I, I know you can. Um. Okay, so, yes, James, you are right. I went to Milan Design Week. I came back, and I started thinking about all the things I saw there. I think we mentioned a little bit on our BYU podcast, because that's kind of when I got back. But, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I, the thing that I started to realize is that there are a lot of pieces of furniture out there in the world. <laughs> You know, I went to the big furniture show. Milan Design Week has a huge has a huge furniture show. Yeah, and um, the thing is, is that you know, I walk around this big convention center, and I see all these chairs, and the chairs are nicely designed, like mm-hmm. great design, like nothing wrong with it, like beautiful, funct- functional. Um, it's it's good. Yeah, but and I start thinking, like, why is it that some chairs are better designed than others. When you think about maybe not to Fukusawa's like Hiroshima chair, mm. you can pull that up if you want. James. Oh yeah. But, uh, you know, or like, you know, Jasper Morrison's new, I think Emiko one inch chair. I mean, you think about, you know, these famous designers designing these chairs and you know, they're becoming like famous chairs. I was like, why is, why is not to Fukusawa's chair? any better than just some small design brand that has a nice, another nice wooden chair. Mm -hmm. And so I started thinking about like what makes a design famous and, you know, kind of observing my surroundings and what gets posted online. Mm -hmm. I realized that, and this is maybe even, this can go pretty deep and I want to hear your thoughts on it, but I feel like what makes a design famous is not the design itself, but just that we are familiar with the design. Hmm. And I, I don't know if that is necessarily uh, a new thought. I'm sure that people have thought about this before. Mm-hmm. But I think the distinctive thing to think about is like, you know, like the Eames lounge chair 
mm -hmm. is not necessarily a great design because there's like a three, you know, 30, 30 centimeter radius on the, I think 30 centimeter radius is huge, but you know, there's like a, th it's not, it's not because of that specific radius on the edge of the chair or that, you know, the wood was this certain shade of like, you know, brown. It's just because it's, it's an iconic design because we've seen it so many times. Okay. 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 Are you, are you hanging in there with me? I'm, I'm hanging in there. Okay. So what, so how I've started to look at this is like, I look at some of, um, a lot of the designers I admire, uh, especially like on Instagram and, uh, you know, design studios like that. I look at like, uh, visibility studio mm -hmm. and their Instagram and what they post. Yeah. And the funny thing about them is they seem to post their same products that they've designed over and over again. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they designed maybe a stool three years ago, but they still post about it. They still post their process about it. And they are posting it and we're becoming familiar with the design, right? Mm -hmm. And so therefore they're kind of elevating that design to be more of a, I wouldn't say famous design, but more well-known. Mm -hmm. And therefore, when you think about a more well-known design, you kind of equate it with good design. And I think there is a distinction there. Like, I don't think all famous design is good design. Mm -hmm. But I think I think a lot of times people can, you know, equate a famous design to being a good design, even if it's not. Because mm -hmm. you think about uh, Philippe Stark's Salif juicer. Salif juicer? Mm -hmm. What's it called? Mm -hmm. Juicy Salif. Which is like this kind of crazy juicer. We talk about it a lot on the podcast. It's a very famous design. Yeah. But it's not a good design from a juicing standpoint. Uh huh. Like it, it's kind of messy. Uh. But, you know, it's like it's this thing that we've seen a gazillion times. And it's not the fact that there was that perfect, like, like if this juicer had four legs instead of three legs, it wouldn't matter. It would still be a famous design. Hmm. Okay. Okay. You got that? Okay. Are you starting to get it? I kind of. Okay. I don't know if you agree with me or not. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna tell you another example that I had. <laughs> okay. So this all stems from seeing something over and over again and becoming familiar with it, right? What's that? Um, and I like to think about music albums. Uh-huh. Your favorite artist comes out with a new album, right? Right. And you listen to it and you're like, oh, oh, that's a little different. I, is this good? I don't really know. Uh -huh. like, okay. Wow. But then you listen to it again and again and again and then you start to like appreciate it you kind of understand the nuances of it mm -hmm. and you really start to like it mm -hmm. and so now that you're familiar with the album you actually enjoy it way more mm -hmm. hmm. okay yeah. let me give and go even deeper let me <laughs> go even deeper okay keep going nick keep um, going i even think this kind of stems a little bit from maybe or like evolutionary of humans in a way right when you think about humans see something that they're familiar with mm -hmm. that means that that familiar thing has not killed them when we see things that are unfamiliar this is like more of a theoretical evolutionary wow. standpoint right when you see something that's unfamiliar you're a little bit hesitant you're a little bit scared mm -hmm. um so familiar things are inviting to us interesting so uh, this is all to say, like, this is just some observation I had. And the so the trick is now, if we know this knowledge, we can use it to our advantage. Uh -huh. So if you want to have, quote unquote, like a famous or a good design, you need to make it familiar yeah. with as many people as possible, hmm. which there's many ways to do that. Like you can post about it multiple times like visibility does. Uh -huh. Or you think about Dieter Rams. His designs are familiar because they they were good designs to start off with. Uh huh. Like these Braun products he designed were unique. People bought them. People loved them. Told each other about them, and it became a familiar design mainly because they just sold a lot and people knew about the brand. Yeah. Interesting. All right. I'll. I don't know. Thoughts. I, I think I've I have. Been a, I've been I, talking a lot. And I, I just. I think I have a lot of thoughts. Okay, first of all, I kind of feel like this is maybe just Nick's ranting off about random stuff. 
But I also feel like there's something in here that I'm trying to uncover. There's there's definitely something to this because I definitely agree. I mean, there's a, there's this the saying about familiarity. And isn't it like familiarity breeds fondness? Yes, it's like the other example is maybe you get that new job right out of school and you go to work for this corporation and you know, maybe you're the youngest person there, not too many attractive people in your age group. Maybe there's that secretary that like she looks nice, but you know, I don't know. And then, you know, a year or two in, you're like, hey, she's actually kind of cute, <laughs> right? And no, it's a real thing. It is a real thing. Yeah. I am. Um, okay. So I'm going to start to try and poke holes in your theory. Okay. Let's hear it. Because there are definitely times where I will see something for the very first time and I have an immediate reaction, which is, oh, this is nice. Yes. Like... And there's nobody, there, there's no prior knowledge of it. There's there's nobody telling me that this is great design. Right. I mean, maybe it's curated, maybe it's on Lemonouche, and so maybe there is already this idea that somebody else is curating this oh, for me. that's interesting. Which could be another contributing factor, but I feel like there are times where I see something and it just speaks to me almost immediately. Yes, I, I definitely agree with you on that. And I, do you think that falls into a familiarism category? Well, or not familiarism, but familiar that like there are elements of it that are familiar to me and therefore I adopt it more easily? Maybe, possibly. Um, but I think maybe a different... And I do want to make a distinction here. I'm not talking about the familiarism philosophy that we talked about right. several episodes ago. I think that that philosophy does have some correlation in some things that kind of stem out of this yeah. conversation. But... Um, I, I'm more speaking to famous design. Okay. Like designs that are famous, not necessarily designs that are good or designs that we like. Yeah. Cause yeah, you can pull up a, a Pinterest or a Le Manouche blog and see amazing designs that you're like, whoa, this is great. I really like mm -hmm. this stuff. Just like I was in Italy. I was like, whoa, all these chairs, they're great. But why is it that one is better than the other? It's not because that one has that perfect angle on the seat. Mm -hmm. But in order in order to be the curated, chosen Eames lounge chair, the Eames lounge chair had to have lasted through a wave of design and emerged as like a favorite. Yes. Because I don't know that it necessarily, like I don't know how it was received at the time, but it was using new technology, which I think is another way that can that can create like a wow factor. Yes. You know, I'm, I'm thinking about the new Philippe Stark chair, which I think is a really awesome chair, the the AI chair. Oh, the, and this one was the folded chair. Is that correct? Or no, it's he. But he's using AI design. Oh, no, we talked about this. This is yeah. the generative kind of. I talked about this with Reed. Yeah, I, a, I listened to that uh, episode. Philippe. It's the only one I've ever listened to <laughs> and wasn't involved in. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Generative design kind of, you know, has these kind of more of weird formed right. legs to it. I personally find this very appealing. Uh, like, and, and almost immediately I found it appealing. I don't know why that is, but it, it also has the story of being this... It has a story. It does it, have a story. It is, it is this thing which was generated between designer and and AI. Yeah, I I think that yes, what you're all, all the things you're saying, James, are correct. Mm -hmm. I think w what I'm thinking is even deeper. Like it's kind of before this underlying level, because like you said, this generative design Philippe Stark chair that we just pulled up, mm -hmm. uh, it you know it it's a really unique an innovative design mm -hmm. for its time right now. Yeah. Is it a famous design right now? It's a new design right now. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say it's a famous design right now. And if this design, no one ever talked about it again or no one ever saw it again, it was never like manufactured or marketed, I think people would forget about it and not consider it a famous design. Maybe, but I don't know how much... I'm trying to think of another another famous design because I because my feeling is is that there's a couple things that could make a famous design, and one of those things is utilizing an emerging technology and reconstructing constructing an archetype in a unique and interesting way. I, I do agree. So the Werner Panton chair, yes. for instance, yeah. 
is like, I mean, it also has an immense story to it, but it's, it has a wow factor. And this is injection molded, right? Yes. Injection molded one piece. Right. Um, and yeah, if you don't know the Werner Panton chair, it's this plastic chair. It has this, these, it's essentially like one surface and the surface kind of swoops back to be yeah. the foot as well. And it's cantilevered. Yeah. But you know, I think it also has the DNA of something that feels soft and comfortable. Like there, there are, even though it's wildly different, you know, in that it is this one of the first all plastic cantilevered chairs. So it has, there is familiarity with cantilever, cantilevered chairs. Um, the one that I'm most familiar with, I think is like the Marcel Brower one that's from the Bauhaus. Um, oh, is this a tube chair? Yeah, it's this, I, we actually Bent had these tube. chairs in my house growing up. With some wicker backing. Um, yeah, wicker. So, I There's mean, this was this was kind of already in in the design zeitgeist. But then Werner Panton comes in with a new material in a new and novel way and generates this cherub. Now, I think it stands the test of time because it's not so out there and so crazy, like, in terms of its form. Like, the form is actually pretty staid. It's actually pretty like it it does what it needs to do to achieve the goals. But when I look at the seat, I'm like, oh, that looks like a comfortable chair, mm. you know, at the same time. And I do agree that there are many factors that do help designs stay around for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe that's kind of like that's the thing is like, you know, I think about the Eames molded plywood chair. Um or even the Eames lounge chair has that molded plywood. Yeah. And at the time that molded plywood was that unique innovation. They were the first people to do it. Um, and so that put them on the map that got them out there mm -hmm. and in the scene. Yeah. And um, yeah, you do need something that gets your product out there in front of all these eyes. Mm -hmm. And maybe that is innovation. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm, that's why I think that's like the core of it is like, you know, you can't put a product out there that looks uncomfortable because no one's going to want to use it or right. see it again. So, yes, it does have to be comfortable. It does have to look comfortable. It does have to be functional. And, you know, it, it maybe it has to be innovative. Right. I don't know. But here's the other thing. Here's here's another idea. <laughs> okay. Um, is that when, when these chairs come out, so your Werner Panton chair or your Eames lounge chair... There are interior designers and architects of the time who are looking for furniture to furnish their new buildings, their new homes, and they have to, I mean, I can't imagine what it's like to be that person who has to sift through all of this furniture right. that's out there and to find things that actually fit into these homes and complement the architecture that they are executing. And so I think that's another thing is like the furniture that you make has to catch, has to kind of catch the eye of that person because they, they are the one who's ensuring the fact that it becomes a familiar object. Yes. That's interesting. Yeah. I mean, I can agree with that. It, it, I feel like it does have to be distinct enough and unique enough to be intriguing, at least for that initial adoption phase. Yeah. Um, because if it's like a very plain and mundane object, I don't think it would attract any attention or that people would care to keep looking at it over and over again. Right. And they would not become familiar with it. Although it could go to the extreme. And I kind of think about, uh, like Jasper Morrison and not Fukusawa's kind of super normal thing, which is, you know, they, just, they, have, they have this idea about kind of the uber mundane, that everyday product that you use, whether it's like a pair of Fisker scissors that, you know, almost are undesigned because they are so distilled to like the nth degree that they don't necessarily have any, any superf superfluous, superfluous, Am I superfluous. Uh, like details. They're just like the central object. Yeah. And I don't think those are famous designs anymore. Like, you know, you think about like I'm look. We're looking right here at a step ladder. Like, a ladder is not a famous design. It's a very familiar object, mm -hmm. 
but it's not a famous design because it is maybe not distinct or like innovative, yeah. kind of like what you're saying. Right. And I have I have one more thought. So the thing that you brought up about music. Yeah. Because I you know, I'm I'm a big fan of music and I often think about music a lot in regards to design and also I I think about why I like the types of music that I do and in some ways I think it has something to teach me about design. Um so w- one thing th- that you brought up was this idea that when a, an artist releases a new album Oftentimes you have to sit with it for a while yeah. because there are certain expectations that you have for what that new album is Right, that you, it, it's often hard to digest because of those expectations and you have to, through the process of listening to it, let go of your expectations in order to like appreciate what it is. Um, and I found that with all of my favorite artists but the other thing that I find, which is interesting, and I don't know if this sparks anything, but is that when I discover a band and I love the album that I've discovered and they have many albums before that, I dive into all of those and I can appreciate all of them immediately. That's interesting. And so it's like it's it's like backwards compatible, but not yeah. like forwards compatible. Yeah. And and it's maybe it's like all of the all of the DNA that that came into what their current album is is reflected. Like so, that whole journey is reflected in those old albums. That I can then appreciate all of those. Uh, I'm not sure, but the one thing that I, that I do know for sure is that I, when I think about my favorite artists, and one of my favorite artists is this producer named Bibio. Okay. And what I feel that I love about him and and many other artists that I like is that they straddle that line of they they hearken back to tradition of in terms of music, but they also push things forward enough that it's new and novel. And, you know, they so they don't completely abandon tradition and so, like, when I think about a designer, like, the most obvious designer to me in that category is somebody like Marcel Vonders, who, like, nods a lot to the past and tradition of design, right. but also executes it in new materials, in new ways that are very, like, novel and interesting. That's, I, I like that as well. I feel like that is the, like, that is the action, like, you know, taking tradition and also pushing it forward like adding a little bit of innovation like that that's the action you do to create a very like you know unique innovative iconic product but i think what i'm saying is Mm -hmm. that new innovative iconic product does not automatically become a famous design unless it gets seen by you know a a bunch of people over and over again Mm -hmm. You know, and I guess my my counterpoint to that, which I guess I've already kind of said, is that unless it is, unless unless it is novel and both familiar enough, then it won't attract the attention of the press. It's a little bit chicken or, and eggs, now. yeah. Is, that's what you're saying, yeah. But I think you can kind of hijack that, <laughs> hijack that scenario though, because I think about like even some of my products, like they're kind of, you know, I wouldn't say. I, I feel like some of my products are kind of dumb and silly in a way. Like <laughs> I like the the strap chair or even my most recent weight weight uh-huh. product. It's like these things aren't really quote unquote good design in a traditional sense. Like uh-huh. it's not following the ten principles of good design that Dieter Rands put out. Um, and I don't know if that's a traditional sense, but it's not like you know they are kind of innovative, pushing the boundary. And if I made them in my workshop, never showed anyone maybe put them on Behance or something, I feel like maybe they wouldn't have gained as much attention as if I kind of promoted them over and over. I don't know. Mm-hmm. That That's that's my theory. Yeah. I just wanted to put that out there because, I don't know, I just it's like been going around my head. And, you know, essentially what I'm taking from this currently right now is like I feel like I'm going to start maybe posting more of my old projects. And instead of saying like, hey, here's a project I did. I finished it. All done. Yeah. I put it online. I posted it back in 2012. Like, yeah. I think I kind of want to like revisit it over and over again, just like highlighting different ideas, thoughts around it, hmm. maybe pulling out details that I've thought about. Uh, but kind of, I guess, revi- like 
I don't know. It's like, it's like if you had a child and then forgot about it forever. <laughs> instead, <laughs> instead of like you have a child and then you know every every birthday you you have a celebration for it again. Right. I don't know. Right. Yeah. A- anyways, I don't want to talk too much about it, but I just felt like it was something that's been on my mind, and I kind of had to get out there just to kind of yeah. It's interesting. I think I it. would love to hear what the Discord has to say about it. I want to hear what people think about it because it is kind of an interesting thought. Yeah. So if you're not on the Discord, hop on there. That's where we've got our community of of listeners who are are chatting about the episodes beyond the episodes and and beyond. They yeah. they are uh, they're chatting about everything, and it's cool because it's it's all. All age groups. Yeah. And it's not scary. I know that my mo- mom, I know you're listening. Uh, chat rooms, I know back in the 2000s were scary places. But no. But now, you know, it's all good. Yeah, We keep it civil. It's very civil in there and very fun. Uh, I really love the Discord. So anyway, shout out to the Discord. All right. Well, yeah, I want to hear your thoughts. Let me know. And uh, let's get to some questions because I've been ranting on too long. Let's go. <laughs> All right, we got some voicemails. We actually got several voicemails. I think a few of them got cut off too soon. If you, if your voicemail got cut off, maybe send us a new one. But um, yeah, let's listen to this first one. Oh, is it playing? <laughs> Here we go. Hey guys, my name is Nick. I'm actually a mechanical engineering student from Boston at Northeastern University. And my question was about 3D modeling. So I'm personally interested in product design and mechanical design, and I find that sometimes when I'm kind of stuck on a concept or or want to come come up with some other solution, whether it be an aesthetic design thing or or some sort of mechanism, I find that actually 3D modeling sometimes helps bring out some more ideas and helps kind of that problem solving. So I was curious if you guys, since you haven't, haven't really heard you guys talk too much about 3D modeling, if you guys view CAD as purely a means to digitize your concepts in 3D, or if you also find some experience, find some experience where the modeling process helps your design, helps iterate or come up with something you didn't think of before. Thanks so much, and keep up the good work, guys. Love the podcast. Well, thanks for sending that in, Nick. Yeah, that's a good, good question. That's a great question, Nick. How do you how do you view CAD? I mean, I would definitely agree that 3D modeling can be a medium for you to explore mm-hmm. uh, concepts, but I don't think it's like a very broad concept exploration medium. And what I mean by that is like you might sketch out a bunch of different ideas, a bunch of different concepts. Maybe, you know, some of these, you know, you're sketching toasters, right? Some of these toasters are, uh, you know, cylindrical or some of them are are boxes i feel like you always go to the toaster it's a, example it's a perfect <laughs> go-to product it's got like functionality it's got touch points it's got toast it's got toast and you know i like toast <laughs> um but you know i feel like once you pick kind of a direction of uh, a singular form you can explore details i feel like cat mm. is a great detail exploration tool so you know you have that box shaped toaster and you can explore well maybe if i put a chamfer on the edge Mm -hmm. or a fillet on the edge yeah i think a lot of the exploration that i do in cad is based around chamfers and fillets right or maybe positions of buttons and and levers and things like that yeah i feel like for nick for somebody that's a mechanical engineer i think you know obviously he doesn't have necessarily the sketching skills that an industrial design student has because, you know, we're required to did have he, that. Did he say he was going to design school after? I, I, is that what he what said? Read the transcript. I'm actually a mechanical engineer from Boston. Yeah. Oh, he didn't say so, anything about... Yeah, so, so I mean, I think for him, the best way for him to visualize what he's working on is through CAD. And so I can see that as being a totally valuable medium for doing that. And I think it it all comes down to complexity. I mean, I think that there's like a certain threshold for like, if you're spending too much time in CAD, just in building to try and iterate, then it's not a very useful tool. Yeah. But if it's something relatively quick and easy, I think it can be used as an iterative tool. Uh, the other thing that you can use it for is um, underlays. I know a lot of people will use it. Um, Mauricio Romano being one of them. 
you know, like using it as uh, as an underlay yeah. for sketching. You make that simple box and you can, you know, over or put it into Sketchbook Pro or Procreate or even just print it out and, on eight and a half by 11 and just take a Sharpie and draw right. over it. So um, I, yeah, I, I hate to draw a hard line in the sand and say it's not for that. The, the other thing that I'll say about CAD is that I often find that if I'm working in CAD, I do have a hard time radically changing the idea. Yes. And, you know, because if you, like I said, if you're, if you're so focused on building one thing and for a long time, it can be hard to just change the whole formation right. of what you've just done. Yeah, you can't go from that square toaster to the circular yeah. toaster in and, CAD. Yeah, so like if you're going to do things in CAD, yeah, I think it's more for me about variations rather than ideation, like vastly different ideas. Yeah. I think that's where sketching will always have an advantage. I do think there is like a, a unique part about having uh parameters though like if there's a project with pretty strict parameters you know let's say again for the toaster like if if you have a client that <laughs> what <laughs> listen i love my toasters when are we going to get the almost object toaster soon coming soon <laughs> <laughs> um you know if the client has like specific dimensions for the toaster and the mechanism yeah. mechanisms already selected right like maybe that is more of a cat exercise right um, but yeah that's a good question um, that that is where I like using, and I and I hate to plug them because they they're not sponsoring me. But uh, that's where I love Onshape, where I can just create a new version and experiment with that, and then you know I can just right. create a version tree of different designs, yeah, um, and have all that catalog of what I've done. Um, thanks for sending that in, Nick. Uh, yeah. Of course, if you have your own voicemails, I just forgot to say the number. It's one six four six four nine four. Forty eleven. Uh, feel free to send in voicemails. We actually, we yeah, we were, voice. we were kind of backlogged on voicemails actually. Yeah. Um, okay, so we got another voicemail in. Here we go. Oh no, hang on. <laughs> the, the UX design is a little poor. Okay. Oh, get oh. on it, Google. No. Okay. Hi, Nick and James. I just want to thank you for making the show. It's uh, been a really big help for me while I'm in school. I just have a quick question for you. I just want to know how important it is, is it to go to a, a to graduate from a recognizable school? Uh, I'm in Canada and my school is not a recognizable name, uh, but the school is good and I'm getting a lot of opportunities, uh, including research jobs and internships. Um, my understanding is that it's all about the portfolio and the experience. Want to know if I'm right or if I should maybe transfer schools in my final year so I can get a better name on my uh, on my resume? Yeah, let me know. Uh, yeah, can't wait to hear the next episode. Thanks. Bye. Good question. Yeah, we didn't get your name, but I appreciate you sending that in. Yeah. Um. I, yeah, I mean, I would say that portfolio matters 100. percent Portfolio is the one and only thing that matters. Yes. I mean, obviously, if you're going to a school that's well connected into the industry, that's going to give you an advantage, a little boost. But, but in the long run, end if, of the day, if you got a strong portfolio, that that is what counts. That is your best foot forward, and um, and I think she also said she likes her school. Yeah, if you like your school, don't don't change. Yeah. I, yeah, I think the school question comes up a lot, especially for, you know, younger students or people looking for schools. Yeah. I mean, I, I get emails and messages about it, but, you know, you, you got to, like, go to a school that you just like being at. Right. I remember walking onto the campus of Virginia Tech, and it kind of didn't matter what I majored in. I just felt like it was the right place that, to be. That's how SCAD is, too. Yeah. So, I mean, Savannah itself is a beautiful city. Right. Um, but, yeah. Uh, yeah, don't worry about the school focus on your portfolio and the the funny thing is that i mean i i feel like i didn't really have this when i was in school and i feel like you definitely did not but the entire internet community now we are so well connected it almost feels like one large school right you know like we're all kind of in this together now whether you you know whether you're at art center or rca or some small school it's like yeah. hey you can see what people over at this other school are doing you can kind of like look at their level of projects and aspire to that or yeah 
The thing that hasn't changed is that Hector Silva liked everything that everybody was doing. Oh. I remember back in the day on Coraflot, <laughs> I knew, I known who Hector Silva was since I was in school. Hector Silva, because th- founder, he was founder of the Advanced Design. So enthusiastic yeah. about design from the get. He's a, he's a fan. Got to got to give him credit for that. That was uh, he's always hustling. Yeah, I was when I when I encountered him on, on Instagram, I was like. I know Hector Silva. I mean, we could go all the way back. You know, the the Core Seven Seven forums were the the OG community. Well, I and... I never got on there. I didn't even know about those. That's that's what I had in school. Yeah, but um, but yeah, thanks for sending that voicemail in. Yeah, uh, and of course, we also like to read submissions from our email as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that email is minordetailspodcast at gmail dot com, and this email comes from Alexander Koala at Alexander koala underscore two uh, <laughs> well is it koala no it's not, it's not koala i'm sorry alex he this man is a koala <laughs> typing with both all four of his thumbs um but this is a fun little question i put this in here because uh it's it's gonna be something that we're gonna we're gonna you're gonna be uh okay let me let me just read the question all right uh they ask what impact do you think vr will have on the design process and everything around it. Hmm. Yes. All right. Announcement. Announcement. Should have done this in a, a weekly update. But uh, <laughs> we got the Oculus Quest. Yes. We both pre-ordered. Nick got his order in milliseconds before mine. <laughs> Actually, minutes because I was having trouble with my card. Yeah. I had to open up a different browser. I don't know if Google... And a new bank account. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> to take out loans but out a second mortgage on my house uh no i mean i i don't know what it was like for some reason google was trying to uh get in the way of me getting google voicemails i had to open playing our voicemails too i had to open up safari (laughs) safari oh man that's like getting a machete and chopping through your laptop and uh yes we we got the quests yes we did we're about to go on a quest Yes, and, a, I, a virtual and I, actually, reality quest. I also got Reed Schlegel's quest because he's going to be out of the country. Reed is, is going to be a VR boy now, too? Oh, boy. And we're all going to be able to play, like, a gravity sketch together in the same, yeah. in the same virtual Although, space. I think I might be, also be out of town. Oh, no, Reed. <laughs> oh, well. Um, but, yeah, we, we both got our Oculus Quest. And for those who aren't familiar with Oculus Quest, it's going to it's the new standalone vr headset by oculus you don't need a big computer anymore mm-hmm. you don't need a big setup nope all you need is the headset and it comes with two controllers and you're good oh it's gonna run gravity sketch it's it's gonna change the game i'm gonna be s- i oh, i'm so excited um yeah so i mean the impact of vr i think is it's definitely it's definitely started it's yeah. definitely i can see the, the the tip of the iceberg but now that this new VR headset out is out, that is much cheaper than the traditional setup. I mean, it's going to demarketize it for sure. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's undeniable. Like this is this is an inevitability. I think designers have been waiting for this forever. Yeah, is that link between sketching and CAD? Right. You know, we were just talking about doing iteration in CAD, and there seems to be no better way to do that than through something like a program like Gravity Sketch. Yeah, I would say VR sketching is the optimal iteration tool. Yeah. The thing is, is getting clients to put on a headset to look at your designs. Well, I mean, you could export. There's many ways to do that. No, you can't. (laughs) Uh, But I I mean, there are many different avenues for sure about how VR sketching will impact design. I mean, like I said, like, you know, or like like we said, like first of all, iteration. I think it's a very strong iteration tool. Yeah. Um. It does. It is going to bridge the gap. I definitely feel feel like it's going to bridge the gap between traditional sketching and CAD. Yeah. A bit. It kind of fits in with that like cardboard foam modeling phase a little bit. Hmm. Um. And and yeah, I mean the client thing is interesting. I mean, if clients have their own headset, they could view your designs in three dimensions. Yeah. Uh. I think another thing that I've always been fond of as well is. The, the idea that you don't have to know perspective anymore. Right. You don't have to know lighting or shadows. Yeah. Which is always the hurdle for people learning to sketch. Right. Yeah, and I was talking to uh, 
you know, Dave, Dave Joseph, we had him on the pod that will be releasing that episode soon. Um, but, you know, I was talking about Keyshot and just like rendering programs in general. And, and I would say that it's a skill that I would like to strengthen because I don't think that I am like the ultimate Keyshot user. I, I know the tools necessary to get the job done, but um, I'm, I'm not an Esben Oxholm and even a Nick Baker when it comes to Keyshot. <laughs> but the thing is, is that it would be great to get to the point where it's all about the design, you know, where the design is the center. I mean, obviously, I think throughout time, there's always going to be the thing about composition and how you present your work. Right. But you, we all know the situation in school where there's just the person that can do the hot sketch. Yeah. Their yeah. design gets chosen. And this could, I don't think it's going to close the gap, but I think it will, it will bring it a little bit more in because there are, narrow. there's also going to be just people that have naturally good, like better sensibilities yeah in design school initially i feel like the the whole sense design sensibility thing is so undervalued yeah in, in design culture right now or, or and i think about more specifically instagram and stuff but um you know people think about like oh i can sketch really well i can render really well but no one ever thinks about like oh i can compose this shape well and this, this is the correct shape right but then again, back to my uh, original topic. It doesn't even matter. Oh no, um, Nick, I I can't agree with you there. I I, I, <laughs> I mean, we made the podcast. The podcast name is Minor Details, right? So it does matter. I just I am uh I, I am sort of in this like juxtap this yin and the yang of some sort. Yes, currently. I think I think you will emerge from this with something a bit stronger because I don't think that it's quite there yet. Okay. I but I do think that you're on to something. Well, the Discord people will definitely help me out. They will help you and out. And I'm sure I'll get many emails of saying like how I'm crazy and like I shouldn't be blasting this stuff <laughs> into the world. <laughs> but no, I mean I I I totally understand and and I love this idea and I I'm excited to see where it goes. Yeah. Um but yeah, thanks thanks for sending it in, Alexander. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we're excited to jump into VR. Oh, absolutely. It's going to democratize it. Yeah. I'm going to be in VR, sketching on a VR iPad <laughs> in Apple Notes <laughs> this Sunday. No, I'm kidding. Um, but yeah, thanks for tuning in, guys. If you have a uh, question yourself, email it to mightydetailspodcast at gmail.com. Mm -hmm. Follow us on Instagram yeah. at, at mightydetailspod. Uh, uh, like subscribe give us some rating on the itunes yes uh we we are i i think we're falling behind in our ranking oh but, uh, yeah but it, you know if you give it that five stars it really helps out um and of course we got merch now so support us that way the minor details pin yeah simple I'm fun great way to support us yeah um and intro and outro is by the amazing kiyoshi the kid amazing kiyoshi the kid and yeah, as always, I'm at Nate P. Baker. I'm at I Draw on Receipts. Peace out. Later. <laughs>